Welcome to Let's Talk, and I'm Darlene. We're having a great day, and we're going to have a great show today. I have my two guests with me. We have James and John. Both are music teachers, musicians, and that's really interesting because that's very near and dear to my heart because I used to be a musician and a music teacher. Welcome to the show, John and Jim. Thank you. How are you? Fine. Very now, good. do you guys work together? We, we don't. used to. Oh, that's in perfect unison. <laughs> See that? You might, might as well have a band here. We used to teach at the same studio. We never actually played together. Okay, and I know John does piano. And what do you do? Well, I'm on guitar mainly, but um, also I have students on mandolin, ukulele, bass, mm -hmm. and the various banjos. Right. Now, I know um, I didn't want to get into this right away, but since we're going to speak about uh, children with issues and children with disabilities in a little while, um, I wanted to mention first, you have written a book. Tell us a little yes. bit about your book. Well, it was probably, I'm not sure, maybe the first on the subject. It was published in 1978, entitled Introduction to the Quarter Tone Guitar. Now, explain to people what I know what a quarter tone is, and John knows what a quarter tone is, but explain to our people. Well, for those that are familiar with the piano keyboard, let's say you were going from one white key to the next adjacent black key, it will be half the distance in sound between the white key and the black key. It will be considered a, a tempered quarter tone. Well, now, tell the people how you get a quarter tone. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Actually, when you play a note on any instrument, particularly if you have a, a big instrument like the piano, the note vibrates as a whole, but it also vibrates in halves and thirds and fourths and fifths ad infinitum. And one of those overtones would turn out to be a quarter tone, or very close to a quarter tone. So is it easier on the guitar to do that, or is it easier on the piano? Um, I should they, be asking have, John that. They've had pianos that have been tuned in quarter tone. In fact, really? Charles Ives mm -hmm. wrote some pieces for the piano. On the guitar, back in 78, I believe it was, I had the uh, Classical Guitar Society in Philadelphia, Luthier, re retrofitted my guitar for a quarter tone. So actually, instead of 12 frets per octave, it would be 24 frets. So oh. the distance mm -hmm. between the frets will be roughly equivalent between a fret on the ukulele to the next fret or the mandolin mm -hmm. to the next fret. So in a little while, small. we're going to get the name of your book and where we can get it. Oh, but you I can't wanna, get I wanna, it. You can't get it anymore. It's out of print. <laughs> it's out of print. Yes. Wait a minute. Now, how many did you print? No, I just, uh, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, now, John, John is not only a music teacher. He is also a well-known equestrian teacher who also does dressage, which is, explain the connection between music and horses and dressage, too. Well, it's a fascinating connection, Darlene. The, um, the rhythms in music uh, correlate perfectly with the rhythms of each gait of the horse. So if you have a walk, it would be 4-4 four, four time, a trot would be 2-4 time, and a canter is 3-4 time. There was actually a book written on equitation, riding, which used the grand staff with the time signature to explain the rhythm of each gait. So I think if you are a good musician, I think you can use that faculty when you ride to feel the rhythm of the horse. When you can feel the rhythm of the horse, then you can help the horse to move better. And so it's a fascinating correlation and dressage actually grew out of a kind of theatrical thing. And obviously, uh, in dressage competition, they have uh, competitions where you choreograph your horse's movements to music. So I think it's really a perfect match. And I've actually used my experience as a musician, a piano teacher. Uh, when I ride, I've used it when I teach riding. And it helps people to understand that they have to feel what's happening with the horse and feel the rhythm of the horse. Have you ever written your own music to play when you were, or played your own music when you did dressage? I never have, but I'm very much interested in uh, developing with the horse I'm working with now and the horses, choreographing it to perhaps something by one of the great masters. Oh, that would be like great. Chopin. That would be great. Yeah. Interesting story. I used to have Arabians, and we had a class called At Liberty, 
where you would just let the Arabian horse go and it would go crazy and they love it, but they could never catch the horse in the end, usually. And we had a horse named Lucky, so I wrote a song and we recorded it and it was called Lucky. So every time it said, Lucky will be your friend, blah, blah, Lucky would go like this. <laughs> and in the very end, it was so funny. He was the only horse that come right back to me and stand in front of me because we had practiced with his song Lucky for so long. So it was a, it was a funny story about him. But um, yeah, so I love that idea. And he, even though he was an Arabian and it wasn't dressage, he would go right in time with the music, which was amazing. We played it over and over and over again. So do the horses feel the rhythm or is it they just do. the person? I think horses relate to music actually in a lot of the big dressage stables. They pipe in classical music because horses relate to it and I think horses being very intuitive animals, they relate to the tonalities and the rhythms. Because I thought it was amazing. He would go it right is. in time with the music. And yeah. at that time, I didn't really know much about horses and music. I mean, I knew music and I knew horses, but I didn't know the correlation. Guys, we're gonna take a short break. We'll be right back with Let's Talk. <laughs> solo I thought that was very interesting and we're going to talk a little bit about teaching and teaching I believe both of you teach children with autism tell me a little bit about that because I'm very interested I have um, an adult who we have we adopted as a child who does have autism and she was always very good with music and with animals music and animals only she was very allergic to animals thank goodness she wasn't allergic to the piano but tell us a little bit about um, teaching them and what you're doing and how you do it. Sure, you wanna go first? Or? Well, my earliest experience was back in the 70s. There was a, a young young boy, disabled. Um, I remember about that, it was probably 78 or thereabouts. He, um, he could not play chords in the instrument. He didn't have the physical ability to <laughs> manipulate several notes simultaneously. But he was able to play single note melodies like a flutist would do. And the thing I remember about him, he was always very happy, even though he couldn't accomplish what most guitarists would be able to accomplish. Nonetheless, it was that mentality that uh, impressed me. And in the years since then, I've had numerous people that have had uh, um, autism, uh, what's that, um, I forget the name of Asperger's? it. Asperger's? Right Asperger's, yes. I had an Asperger's student that memorized Pi, I think. Oh, uh, they memorized everything. Oh, it was amazing. But he had difficulty relating to people. Yes. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically I try to apply principles with them. I don't force any regimen upon them. Uh, I try to be flexible. I try to be that with all students, but particularly with mm -hmm. people that have those disabilities. Right, and John, and I, I know you're, you're working with some students too that have disabilities. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I started, I guess, around 10 years ago uh, when I used to teach in the home and they asked me if I would work with some special needs students. So I kind of learned just by what my experiences have been in teaching over the years, pretty much what Jim said. Uh, I found that the, aut the autistic students tend to internalize and they would not communicate. So I would try to use the piano as a catalyst for verbal communication so that as they touch, they hear the tones of the piano uh, and 
the autistic students, I'm sure as Jim would agree, have very good memorization skills. Yes. So I would use that, capitalize on that, <coughs> so that they would begin to, to memorize chords. I would use a chord approach, kind of like playing a fake book or lee sheets. Mm -hmm. And once they could play a melody, then you would see that they were making a connection to a language, mm -hmm. then it became easier to get them to verbalize. So one would help the other. When they would start to talk about what they were doing, their actual playing improved. So I would kind of like use the verbal communication as a tool. I would try to initiate conversations about the music. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the name of the music? Who is the composer? Uh, what are the names of the chords? So I think it's an excellent way to bring them out of the shell they go into, mm -hmm. that kind of autistic shell sure. where they won't communicate. Now, have either of you ever worked with them in a group? Because I believe that music is the universal language, and I think if you would get a few of these children together, they could communicate through music. Have either of you done that or thought about that? Unfortunately, I never had that experience. We were, I was teaching at a studio where it was one-on-one, -on -one. And they, they had group lessons and so forth, but they did not have mm -hmm. uh, a specialized group for autistic children. So I haven't had that experience. I think it would be interesting to see them yeah. play and communicate through their music. Yes. I, I really do. Now, have either one of you um, given lessons to students who are pretty much nonverbal? Oh, uh, yes, mm -hmm. very much. Because I think you have one that yes. I, I met. Uh, how, how does that work? How do you communicate with them? Do you well, show them more uh, than tell them? Yeah, you have to uh, kind of teach the piano as a pictorial, something that they see as a picture, mm -hmm. the music and the configuration of chords can become a visual thing in their mind. Mm -hmm. So that they, you know, they learn the numbers of the fingers, the configurations become a picture in their mind. So you tap into their they seem to have very good imaginative skills mm -hmm. where they can imagine. Uh, but yes, it's, it's the verbal thing seems to improve as they play more music. And then what they're getting a sense of achievement, so that builds their sure. confidence. Uh, yeah. Have you had that experience? Not particularly with that. I do remember one student had um, Asperger's, I believe, not the one I alluded to previously. It was funny. He uh, he actually had an, an additional digit on one of his feet. Right. So he would be proud to show off that additional. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was not sad at all about it. And we used to joke about it. I would tell him, well, it's a shame you didn't have it on your left hand. Yeah, really, you could really play a lot more. An improvement, yeah. But they're, they're, the ones that I taught have been very easy to communicate with. So they were verbal, most of them. That's so I really, didn't have that really experience. That's really great. Um, I, my daughter, who was adopted, um, she she was so uh, she would embellish on everything, including mm -hmm. music, for instance. And she's fine now. She went to college, and you know they had said she will not get past first grade. None mm -hmm. of that was true, mm -hmm. and I think music really helped. But it was very interesting because I remember one of the tests way back when she was really young. They said, um, "Repeat what we say." The man fed his dog. Well, when she repeated, it was, the man walked down the street, he went across the street to the supermarket, he bought dog food, and he bought a dog bowl. He came back, and he poured the dog food in the dog bowl, and he fed his dog. So it was like this big imagination. It wasn't, and I found that even with music, it was like that. They could be creating mm -hmm. with the music more than actually we would. I, I mean, that was just my personal experience, but I was so surprised. And they said that was pretty normal with some of the kids, especially with the yeah. Asperger's yeah. children, that it would yeah. just be this whole big, everything had to be detailed. Mm -hmm. But then other things were just completely focused. For instance, if you would say, take the clothes out of the laundry basket, it would be only the clothes. Okay. So um, in one way, they would be so embellished on what you're saying. And then on the other hand, it would be precise. So you had to learn to deal with that. But I, I just don't believe in limitations. Really, I don't. I think that 
everybody can go as far as they can go. And I think what you're doing is wonderful, teaching these children with mm -hmm. the music. I never taught the children with music. I just, I taught music, but not children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even call it disabilities because some of them are much more talented than we are. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take a short break and we will be right back with Let's Talk and our two great guests. two very talented guests, Jim and John. Sounds like a musical group, it Jim and John, good. both musicians and music teachers. And uh, we've been speaking about teaching children with autism and Asperger's. I think now they're not even using Asperger's, they're using autism not otherwise specified. Someone oh. just told me they just changed it. They're not, they're not, saying, a oh. they're not saying Asperger's, but um, I think it's amazing what you're doing. And um, I know you were just telling us about one of your students, and I think you have another one who might come over because they like horses too, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Um, John has brought one of his students over and he's really interacting well with the horses. Tell he us is. a little bit about that. Well, he uh, loves animals. And I find that many of the autistic students, as Jim may have found, they do have a strong interest in uh, the natural world and in animals. So Ryan, the student that we're talking about, uh, the father takes him on the beach, he takes him hiking, so he loves the outdoors. And he loves animals, you know, they, they had a cat, they just, uh, they had a dog rather, which passed away, so they bought him a cat. So the horses, I think, uh, are a way, again, of him coming out of himself, and uh, I'm teaching him how to brush the horse, how to groom the horse, how to lead the horse. So it's a way of him to relate to another animal in a physical way, but mm -hmm. in a way where, again, he has to have a certain connection to the external world. And he seems very gentle, too. He is very, very. gentle. Did you yeah. say he does have a cat or he needs a he cat? He does have a cat. Does yeah. he want another cat? He might. He I have a cat <laughs> here, which uh, I have to tell you a little bit about that. I have a horse rescue, John works with the horse rescue. He helps us out quite a bit, training the horses. That's, that's a whole other show. John's an incredible trainer, but I recently was asked to take some cats in, and it, it, there were two really sad stories, and I'll tell you very quickly. There's a country club in Marlton, and there's also a post office in Mount Laurel, and both of them had wonderful groups of ladies who were feeding these cats, and they were trapping them, and they had them neutered, and they had them uh, their shots and everything. And all of a sudden, both places said, we want them out, and they were going to call animal con control and bring them to the um, county shelter. Now, if you bring a feral cat to the county shelter and no one claims it, and obviously no one will claim it because it's just a wild cat, as they say, 
uh, quite a few times. They do euthanize them humanely. But so these ladies came to me since we have the farm and they said, could you take some of these cats? So I am now a feral cat colony. Feral cat means kind of like a cat that's not been tame. Now some of them are pretty friendly. They just, you know, they're not gonna sit on your lap. But so our, our idea was to get them microchipped and actually register them with the county animal shelter. Mm -hmm. And these lovely ladies built a huge, you helped them move it, a huge cat, I wanna call it a cat mansion, you know, behind one of our barns and we're going to house the cats and then we'll let them go after a certain amount of time. Hopefully they'll stay around. But I had to say that when That's you said okay. a cat. But I have some of the inside cats, which is why I sound like this, because I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> and I have five of them inside the house. So I would love to have someone uh, adopt a few, and that's another thing. If anybody would like to adopt a cat from me, you could just call me, 609-820-6377. We also have horses up for adoption. So getting back to, um, if you have any final things you would like to say about um, the teaching or anything you'd like to talk about. Go ahead, Jimmy. Well, I'm teaching currently at the uh, Rowan College at Burlington County. I've oh, been wonderful. About 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. Now, are you teaching music lessons or music theory? One-on-one uh, -on -one music lessons Wonderful. For the, on the credit side. I also teach on the non-credit side also. But it, it's, and I run a guitar ensemble there, which is oh, interesting because wonderful. most guitarists don't have the opportunity to play, if they're classical guitarists, they're used to playing solo, or if they're in a rock band, but they, it's not the same scenario. Right. As having written material like um, classical pieces or, Broadway show I would whenever. love to have a video and have you back on with some of the kids if they were interested with right this now ensemble. they're adults. They're, they're adults. They're adults. adults. They're yes. all adults. Yes. Oh, wow. Now, which Rowan College are you in? The one in Burlington? I'm, I'm the one that used to be called Burlington County. Oh, College. so you're, you're close Bro to where? Rowan took yeah, it over, you're close yes. to the, um, you're close to our animal rescue. Yes, or right on Route 38. That's yes. wonderful. How many people are in the ensemble? Right now we have three, but That's I've had great. as many as ten. It must, it must be wonderful to hear all the guitars together. I think that must yeah. be beautiful. And some of them are my arrangements, so it's nice that, to hear these oh, arrangements. Oh, I, I have to hear them. If they're yeah. going to play anywhere, I want to go. And John, what would you like to add in case anyone wants to get in touch with you or get lessons or horseback riding lessons? How do we get in touch with you? Well, I work uh, at Main Street Music, uh, giving private piano lessons in Mullica Hill. And I teach also at Sam Ash and Cherry Hill. Um, and, uh, you know, I train horses at the uh, <laughs> Forgotten Angels stable. Rescue. Forgotten Angels. That's a uh, new thing, thanks to John. We're trying to build up lessons to try to help get the word out that uh, these wonderful horses that could have been slaughter-bound are now, you know, in fact, John may be showing one in dressage, which would be an amazing story mm -hmm. from the slaughter pipeline to the show ring. Mm. I think that would be wonderful. I think it would be an incredible thing. I think uh, you're doing an incredible thing and you know I admire what you're doing and the animals. Uh, Jim and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, you know there are responsibility. They can't uh, fend for themselves in the world as we made it. So we need to see that they're taken care of. And as you pointed out, Darlene, I think everything is significant. You know, I don't, when I ride and train a horse, I don't look at a horse being subservient. Mm -hmm. I look at the horse as an equal. It's like a working partner. Right. So I think what you're doing, I, I want to commend you <laughs> on your Well, John, it profession. isn't me. I'm just mm -hmm. like putting it together. If it yeah. weren't for the wonderful volunteers, the friends, the people that help us, I couldn't do this. I can't take any of the credit, seriously. I just kind of am the orchestra. I'm the orchestrator. You're the conductor. And I'm the conductor, <laughs> and they are the symphony. Right. And the horses are the instruments, which mm -hmm. are amazing. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. We are on demand 24 hours a day. Go to Let's Talk on rvntv.tv. And hopefully next week I won't be around cats. And I will get my voice back. But thank you and have a wonderful, blessed week.